Before we begin, I want to give a very special thank you to Hunt a Killer for sponsoring this video. If there's something extra special about October, it's that each year, on the final day of the month, Halloween is celebrated around the world. It truly is the season of scares, and the potential is limitless. However, in a year where a pandemic has stripped some of that potential away, many of us wonder how we will keep that spine-chilling charm alive on Halloween night. Luckily, we've solved that mystery with a game of Goosebumps that doesn't require you to leave the comfort of your own home in the made-for Halloween masterpiece called Hunt a Killer. In this subscription-based interactive game of sleuthing, you'll receive regular monthly deliveries with new cases to crack each time. Each box includes a unique mystery, sucking you into a world of clever clues, mind-bending puzzles, and the chance to finally solve that murder keeping you up at night. No need to stitch together a last-second detective costume with banks of evidence and audio resources provided for you right in your living room. And if in-depth storytelling is more your vibe, each case dives deep into its own original characters with intriguing backgrounds, assembling a detailed narrative that's more than just a bloody crime scene. And whether you take on the hunt by yourself like a hard-boiled private eye or with a crew of crafty friends over Zoom, Hunter Killer can bring people together for the perfectly satisfying Halloween horror. Not only that, but we have all played the game and found it to be far more engaging than your everyday true crime documentary or blockbuster thriller. As you know, at Cold Case Detective, we try to give you the opportunity to involve yourself with and become an integral part of the cases we cover. And this game does that and more. In these cases, you are the Sherlock Holmes. You are the Agatha Christie. Right now, you can go to hunterkiller.com forward slash cold case detective and use the promo code CCD for 20% off your first box. Again, make sure to use CCD for a 20% discount to pick up your first box and support the channel at the same time. Thanks again to Hunter Killer for supporting this video and to all of you for making everything that we do possible. With that in mind, only one question remains. Will you come alive this Halloween to hunt a killer? With news sources at our fingertips 24-7, it's hard to disregard the mountains of crime that occur on a daily basis. Sadly, as a result, many old cold cases vanish from our minds and from news outlets, forgotten and ignored. More importantly, these crimes go without justice, sometimes for centuries, tragically lost to an age without the resources and attention we give to crimes today. But we must remember that the people of these stories were just as real and their fate just as deserving of justice as those of us alive today. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be shedding light on two old and tragic disappearances that were never solved. Charlie Ross. Charles Brewster Ross, who generally went by the nickname Charlie, was America's first kidnapping for ransom victim back in 1874. Despite the fact that his case is nearly a century and a half old, it continues to go unsolved, and the fate of Charlie Ross remains unknown. Charlie was born on May 4th, 1870 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Christian K. Ross and his wife, Sarah Ann, and had two brothers and three sisters. The couple were, for a time, relatively well off and lived in a large mansion in Germantown, a well-to-do area of Philadelphia. On July 1st, 1874, Charlie and his six-year-old brother, Walter, were playing in the family's front garden. Sarah Ann was away in Atlantic City, recovering from an illness, while Christian spent most of the day working at his store. The children were watched over by the home's servants, 
When Christian returned home from work, he was not immediately alarmed to find that Walter and Charlie were not in the front garden, as one of the maids claimed they had seen the boys playing out on the street with friends. However, Christian was soon alerted by a neighbor who'd witnessed the boys being taken away in a horse-drawn carriage. It was later uncovered that over a period of several days, two men had supplied the children with sweets, and on July 1st, they'd approached and offered Charlie and Walter not only sweets, but fireworks too. They promised the children they'd get both of these things if they agreed to ride with the strangers. The boys agreed, but shortly after pulling away from their home, four-year-old Charlie began to cry. Walter was dropped off at a local store and given money to buy fireworks, but when he returned, the kidnappers and his brother were gone. Walter was soon reunited with his family by a local citizen, but Charlie remained missing. On July 3rd, Christian placed an ad in the local paper, offering $300 for his son's safe return. Soon after this, he began to receive ransom letters from the apparent kidnappers. The letters came in the form of notes mailed from post offices in Philadelphia and beyond, and they were written poorly. The handwriting was described as odd, while the writing itself barely literate with extremely poor spelling and grammar. The ransom letters demanded $20,000 for the safe return of Charlie, which is the equivalent of around $450,000 today. The kidnappers cautioned the family against contacting law enforcement and threatened to hurt Charlie if Christian did not cooperate. However, by this point in time, the Ross family had lost a considerable amount of their wealth. Although they continued to live in a large house in an affluent area, Christian's store was beginning to buckle due to the stock market crash of 73, and the family was heavily in debt. As a result, they simply could not afford the ransom demands. The family saw no way out, and so they contacted their local police department. Several prominent Philadelphians enlisted the help of the famous Pinkerton Detective Agency, the same agency which we've covered on a previous episode of Cold Case Detective, discussing Dorothy Arnold. The agency printed thousands of flyers and posters featuring Charlie's likeness, and while the police officers conducted one of the 19th century's biggest manhunts, they could not locate the missing four-year-old. While several attempts were made to deliver the ransom money to the kidnappers, each time the perpetrators failed to appear. After 23 notes, Charlie's abductors ceased communicating with his family. The case took a twist five months later when, on the night of December 13th, the house of a judge living in Brooklyn was burgled. The judge's brother, who lived next door, gathered members of his household and they each armed themselves with weapons and set out to catch the intruders. The men gunned down both burglars, career criminals named Bill Mosher and Joe Douglas, who were recently released from jail. While Mosher was killed instantly, Douglas lived two more hours and was able to briefly communicate with the men who'd shot him. It seems to be rather unclear exactly what Joe Douglas said that night, but the general consensus appears to be that he admitted that he and Mosher had abducted Charlie Ross, but he also said that his now dead partner knew the current location of the four-year-old. After this, however, his statements became unclear again. There is some confusion over whether he admitted that Charlie was dead or whether he stated that the boy would be returned to his family in a few days. It seemed to be agreed upon that Douglas would have no reason to lie because he knew he was dying when he confessed. If Charlie was still alive at the time the two men passed away, he was never returned to his family. Soon after this, Walter Ross was taken to New York to see if he could identify Mosher and Douglas as the men who'd taken Charlie that day in July. Walter immediately recognized them, especially Mosher, who had a distinctly malformed nose as the cartilage had been destroyed by cancer. It was soon discovered that a disgraced policeman named William Westervelt was an associate of Bill Mosher and also his brother-in-law. Westervelt was arrested and held in connection with the case, and in 1875, he was tried for Charlie's kidnapping. While awaiting trial, Westervelt apparently told Christian that Charlie was alive at the time of Mosher's death. However, the former police officer could not be tied to the crime, and Walter insisted that he was not one of the kidnappers. 
Subsequently, Westervelt was found not guilty of kidnapping, but was convicted of a lesser conspiracy charge and ultimately served six years in prison, though he continued to maintain his innocence throughout his sentence. In the first year alone following Charlie's kidnapping, 600 sightings flooded in from all across the country, but sadly, none of them panned out. Two years after he went missing, Christian's father wrote a book about the case and had it published. He used the money he made from his best-selling novel to continue his search for his son's whereabouts. By 1878, the media frenzy surrounding the case began to peter out. To renew interest, Christian had the book reprinted and began giving lectures in Boston. Both he and Charlie's mother, Sarah Ann, continued to search for their son until the day they passed away. Christian in 1897 and Sarah Ann in 1912. The couple followed copious amounts of leads, interviewed over 570 people, and spent approximately $60,000 searching for Charlie, hoping that one day they could bring him home. In 1924, to coincide with the 50th anniversary of when Charlie vanished, the local papers began reporting on the case again. By that time, Walter Ross was an adult and working as a stockbroker. He reported that he and his siblings continued to receive letters from men claiming to be their missing brother, and during their lifetime, it was found that the siblings investigated around 1,000 impersonators. The most notable of these came from a man named Gustav Blair, who was a 69-year-old carpenter living in Phoenix, Arizona in 1934 when he came forward. He petitioned for the courts to recognize him as the real Charlie Ross, claiming that he'd been abducted as a child and lived in a cave for a time, before being adopted by a man who later told him in 1908 that he was the missing four-year-old from Philadelphia and that he had kept him for the kidnappers. The Ross siblings were not happy about this. With Walter, exhausted from the years of con men attempting to get a slice of the family inheritance, labeling Blair a crank and saying that he found Blair's story to be unconvincing. He added later that he believed the idea of Charlie still being alive was absurd, stating, we've long ago given up hope that Charlie would ever be found alive. Despite their unhappiness, the Ross family did not spend time contesting Blair's claims, and so the court ruled that he was Charles Brewster Ross. Even with this, Blair was never acknowledged by the family as their missing brother, and they did not leave him any money or property from their parents' estate. For a short while, Blair moved to LA and attempted to sell his life story to a movie studio, but this endeavor failed. He eventually moved to Germantown, then back to Phoenix with his wife. Blair died in December of 1943, aged 73, still claiming to be Charlie Ross. However, his descendants later took a DNA test, which conclusively proved he was not the missing child, but really a man named Nelson Miller. The fates of Westervelt, Mosher, and Douglas served as a deterrent to anyone who wished to kidnap for ransom. The next high-profile ransom case did not occur until 1900, when 16-year-old Edward Cuddy Jr. was abducted while running errands. The case of Charlie Ross was what prompted the famous don't take candy from strangers notion, and the missing persons database, the Charlie Project, was named after him. Not only this, but as a result of the case, Pennsylvania later became the first state to pass a law changing kidnapping from a misdemeanor to a felony. The Ross family home was torn down in 1926, and Walter passed away in 1943. With him died perhaps the final chance of ever recovering Charlie. It is a curious case, as the identity of the kidnappers is known, but the location of Charlie has never been discovered, and even today, almost a century and a half later, his fate continues to elude authorities and his family. Louis Le Prince. Louis Le Prince was a French artist and inventor, famous for his creation of the early motion picture camera. He was the first person to shoot a moving picture sequence, utilizing a single lens camera and a strip of paper. 
Although many will cite the Lumiere brothers and Thomas Edison as the inventors of the motion picture, that's largely because Louis went missing just before he was due to publicly reveal his inventions. Louis was born in the city of Metz in France on August 28th, 1841. His father was a major of artillery in the French army and was also an officer of the Légion d'Honneur, a French order established in 1802. Louis spent much of his time in the studio belonging to his father's friend, a photographer who taught him about chemistry and photography, sparking his interest that would lead to his famous invention. As a result, Louis went on to study painting in Paris and postgraduate chemistry in Germany. In 1866, Louis left the country when he made the decision to move to Leeds, West Yorkshire, England, where a friend of his named John Whitley had invited him to join his engineering company. Three years later, in 1869, Louis married John's sister, Elizabeth, who was an artist. Together, the newlyweds shared their own educational establishment, the Leeds Technical School of Art, in 1871. Their techniques were unique and popular, affixing colored photography onto metal and pottery. Several household names at the time, including Queen Victoria and Prime Minister William Gladstone, commissioned the couple for portraits in this unusual style. For a short while after opening the school, Louis spent some time managing French artists, and he began to build a 16 lens camera before returning home. In May of 1888, Louis built a single lens camera, an updated version of what he used to shoot several motion picture films, the most notable of which is known as Round Hay Garden. He also shot several other films, including one of his son, Adolf, playing the accordion, and one simply referred to as Leeds Bridge. In 1889 and 1890, he and a mechanic named James Longley attempted to create a projector so that the camera's images could be seen. According to family and friends, they had seen the projector in use, but the technology was never revealed to the public. In September of 1890, Louis began to prepare for his trip to the United States, where he'd premiere his work publicly. Before he departed for America, he went to see his brother, Albert, in Dijon. Little is known about Louis's time here, his mood, or what the siblings spoke about, but what we do know is that on September 16th, the 49-year-old boarded a train to Paris, but when it arrived, Louis was not on board, and neither was his luggage. It was suspected at first that he'd simply got on a later train, but he never reappeared, and was never seen again. French police, Scotland Yard, and family and friends all helped to search for the missing man, but he was never located, and there was no evidence or information to go on. Albert was the only witness to see Louis board the train, leading to theories that he was the one responsible and that he had killed Louis and disposed of his body and belongings for financial gain. However, there is simply no evidence to back this theory up. Without any real leads, what we're left with is a number of theories. The grandson of Louis's brother allegedly told a film historian that the inventor wanted to take his own life because he was on the verge of bankruptcy. It's possible he arranged for his body and belongings to never be recovered. However, it's noted that Louis's business was very profitable and that he was proud of his inventions. It's likely he'd have come into money with the unveiling of his latest creations. As a result, it seems unlikely that he would wish to end his life for those reported money issues alone although it could explain why neither his body nor his items ever resurfaced. Christopher Rawlance, the author of the 1990 book, The Missing Real, which discusses Louis's case, states the possibility that the 49-year-old was assassinated over patents. He claims that at the time of his vanishing, Louis was going to patent his projector in the UK, then leave Europe for his scheduled exhibition. Rawlance does not appear to be the only one who suspects this, as Louis's widow, Elizabeth, is said to believe that this was the end that her husband met. A Science Direct article from 2008 claims that a student at the University of New York found Thomas Edison's journal in the archives of the New York Library. A small entry from September 20th, 1890 read, quote, Eric called me today from Dijon. It has been done. Prince is no more. 
This is good news, but I flinched when he told me. Murder is not my thing. I'm an inventor, and my inventions for moving images can now move forward. However, this note was authenticated by only one historian, so its legitimacy still remains questionable. In 1966, another theory suggested the idea that Louis had voluntarily disappeared due to financial reasons and familial inconveniences. A journalist claimed that in 1977, he had been shown a note which confirmed that Louis had passed away in Chicago in 1898, having moved there at the request of his family when it was revealed that he was a homosexual. However, as with all the theories, the evidence to support this is close to non-existent. The only other lead came from 2003, during research in the Paris police archives when a photo of a drowning victim was discovered. The man in the image is said to resemble Louis and was dated from 1890. However, nothing further appears to have come from this piece of potential evidence. Just one year after Louis' disappearance, Thomas Edison claimed the patent of inventing the motion picture with his kinetoscope invention. In 1898, Louis' eldest son, Adolf, who had helped in many of his father's experiments and even featured in one of his first motion pictures, went to court as a witness for the defense in a case which Edison had brought against the American Mutoscope Company. The company claimed that Louis was the first inventor of the motion picture camera and was so entitled to the royalties. They hoped that by citing Louis' achievements, they could stop Edison's claims in their tracks. Ultimately, the case went against the company, however, which was no surprise given how wealthy and well-established Edison was as an inventor. A year later, however, this ruling was overturned. Just two years after his court appearance, Adolf turned up dead from a gunshot wound on Fire Island in New York. It has never been made clear if he took his own life, if the shot had been accidental, or if someone else had pulled the trigger. His mother believed that he was executed in revenge for Adolf testifying in court against Edison. Louis was declared dead in 1897. Several different books, films, and documentaries have since been created about his bizarre case and his achievements. Several of his inventions are housed in Bradford's National Science and Media Museum, and multiple of his patents still remain. A BBC article from 2015 asked Laurie Snyder, Louis' great-great-granddaughter, what she thought of his disappearance. Snyder personally believes that Louis took a cab from the train station in Paris, having arrived at about 11 p.m. She thinks that the driver took advantage of the darkness and the fact that the inventor was alone and struck him across the head before throwing him in the Seine. Reportedly, two articles from the time suggested that thieves were targeting lone travelers. Snyder says she can't believe that a man who loved his family so much, as evidenced by his letters, could willingly vanish or take his own life, and also adds that the idea of Albert executing his brother was absurd, as the family were famously very close. As for the Edison theory, Snyder believes that he probably had better things to do than pick off his rivals. Whatever the case may be, it seems likely that we will never know the truth about what happened to Louis Le Prince that night of September 16th, 1890. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. If you're still hungry for true crime content, you can check out the Cold Case Detective podcast by following the link below. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.